Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire, the Leadership Development Podcast, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua double underscore Stamper. Dr. Clark, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And I just was telling you, I have been a huge fan of your book, If the Dance Floor is Empty, Change the Song. I love the title, but I even love the content. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. And before we dive into that book, I would love to learn about your leadership journey. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for the compliments on the book. It's uh, one I'm really proud of. Uh, I am in my 10th year as a school superintendent, and I'm just finishing my 29th year of education, believe it or not. I was an English teacher, a high school English teacher for six years, and then I did high school assistant principal, middle school principal, uh, personnel director, assistant superintendent, and now superintendent for wrapping up my 10th year. Superintendency has all been in the same district, but I've been in five or six different school districts in my career. I also teach at the American College of Education and have the book out. So that's really about who I am and and what I've been doing. Okay, before I get into all of the leadership things, I got to know, you were a disc jockey, is that correct? Yep, that's where the title comes from. I was a, <laughs> I was a mobile DJ for about 24, 25 years. You know, when you become a teacher, a lot of teachers have to work extra jobs. Yeah. And I always did. You know, I, I always worked at least three jobs at a time. Hmm. I was a teacher. And then I was a mobile DJ. And I was also a camp director. So that's where I got a lot of the stories for the book. But weddings, parties, school dances... I want to call it a claim to fame, but maybe a brush with greatness as I DJed LeBron James's high school graduation party. Oh, that's awesome. I'm here in the I'm here in the Akron area. Yeah. Um, so also I've, I got to do when John Elway and Dan Marino were inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I got to do parties for them. So those are the three really cool ones I've done. Other than that, it was just hundreds and hundreds of weddings and parties and school dances so that's awesome that's where the book comes from yeah so what's the correlation did you use any of those techniques as far as being a dj into the classroom as a teacher absolutely so the title comes from this when i you know when i first started as a dj i I found myself spending a lot of time blaming the audience for stinking (laughs) you know I'd, i'd be at a wedding reception and people want to be dancing and i'd say oh these are these guys are horrible they're horrible and then i i had a bit of an epiphany it's like you know, it's my fault. <laughs> if, if if the dance floor is empty, I need to change the song. I need to put something on that they're going to dance to instead of hoping that they like what I am playing. Um, and so I made that extension into the classroom really for any, prof- any um, person in the education field, but specifically for teachers, mm-hmm. that if you have students that are not engaged in your lesson, you can sit around blaming the students for not being engaged or you can change the song. You can do something that is going to engage kids. And then as I moved my way up the, the ladder, you know, the same with the principal. You know, if you're at a faculty meeting and you have a bunch of people reading the newspaper, that's not their fault. That's your fault. You yeah. got to change that message. And it goes all the way up to the superintendent. When I have my principal's meetings and I have a bunch of principals with eyes glazed over, you know, change the speaker. Don't change the audience. Yeah, that's very true. And we don't have any control over that, right? Our audience is our audience. So yeah. obviously we have to have control in a different way. And so I want to talk about your leadership journey now. You were in the classroom. It sounds like you were successful, you know, trying new things. And then all of a sudden you become an administrator. So let's talk about that journey. Did you ever foresee yourself in that role? Or is this something that you aspired to be when you were a teacher? Oh, or? That's a good question. I think First of all, I don't know if I was a good teacher or not. I look back on my career. Again, I've been I've been an administrator for 23 years. I taught for six. And I look back now and I think, man, I did some really great, innovative things as a teacher. And I think, man, I did some really horrible things as a teacher. <laughs> I, I could have been so much better. But did I want to become an administrator? I, I don't know that I that I did. I think, you know, I worked on a degree to get my uh, master's so I could be a principal or have a principal's license. I'm not sure that I wanted to be one, but there were things that I would notice uh, that would tell me maybe it's time to move into uh, administration. Specifically, I remember one time where I'm sitting in the lounge and one of my colleagues was sitting there complaining that she had like three or four more kids in her study hall than I did and how she was going to make a big issue of that. And it, it, to me, it, it, it got to the point where I was seeing, at least in that position where I was, that, that the 
teaching staff was more focused on, you know, the contract and things instead of doing what was good for kids. So I thought, you know what, it's time for me to maybe look. And I applied for a job on a whim. My assistant principal at the time said, hey, I know you just got your degree. Why don't you apply for this job? And I didn't want it. And I think the best time to interview for a job is when you don't want it because you're more honest. And sure. I ended up getting it. And from there, things just kind of opportunities just open for me. And even where I am now as a superintendent, I tell people, I don't, nobody in their right mind wants to be a superintendent. The hours are horrible. People get mad at you all the time. Um, but it's also, to me, it's a, it's a calling, really. It's about service to others. And the higher you move up the food chain, the more power you have to help people in need, which is what I really love about it. Yeah. And I want to talk about your book about advice for principals. And, you know, as far as my listeners go, there obviously there's aspiring leaders, but there's a lot of current leaders that are listening to the podcast. And you had some advice and you said there are five words that are the most important. I'm sorry I was wrong. <laughs> and I was absolutely I was very surprised by that. So will you just kind of expand on why you think those are the five most important words? Yeah, you know, and that, that's something actually, every time I interviewed for any position at the end, when they're like, you know, would you like to say anything else? I would always say this. The only thing I can promise you is I'm going to mess up. That's the only <laughs> thing I can promise you, right? Because I am human. Mm -hmm. But when, you, when I do mess up, I'm going to admit it. I'm going to apologize and I'm going to make it right. And I think that's so important. People in leadership positions gain a ton of credibility by admitting when they make a mistake and apologizing for it. But as, as I've gone through my career and seen people come and go in different positions, it seems to me the ones that fail are those that have the ego that, you know, I'm in the position because it's a title and it's more money and it's power and do what I say and that never make mistakes. And I'll be the first one to tell people, hey, I screwed up. And part of that's my upbringing. I'm the youngest of 11 kids, 10 older brothers and sisters. So there's no way when you're the youngest of 11 that you can get much of an ego. So um, <laughs> they remind me constantly how insignificant I am. And so I've carried that into my my profession that, you know, I know that I'm, I am one cog in the machine. My title might give me a different job description, but I'm no more important than anybody else who's working on the team. Yeah, and I think that's a pretty large misconception, I guess, for any new leader. You know, when you were an assistant principal, I know when I was a dean of students coming from a teacher, I thought, like, I couldn't mess up. I was so fearful of, of screwing up, even though many times I didn't know what the role entailed. So for any new leaders, what happens when they do mess up? What should they do from there? Again, I think the very first thing you should do when you mess up is admit it. First of all, if anytime somebody tries to cover anything up, it's going to be a lot worse, right? So I think it's best to, um, as soon as you make that realization, hey, I made a mistake, it's to go to whoever's in charge of you and say, you know what, I made a mistake. What can I do to make it right? And I think typically people, you know, your superior, your boss, whoever, will be very grateful that you did that instead of waiting until it kind of came to their attention another way. And then I think what you do is you just correct whatever you can correct. There's almost nothing that we do in our profession that is permanent. You know, yeah. most things that we do, we can fix. Go back. You can change your mind. It might irritate some people. It might make uh, inconvenience some people. But I think mm -hmm. people will respect the fact that you are human and you thought about it and you realize, hey, I made a bad decision here. So as a superintendent now within your district, you know, coming into that role, I mean, it's not like you can really prepare for that position. <laughs> so how did you, how did you go in with a, with a vision? Like what was the first like 90 days within the position for you? Oh, that's a great question. You know, my entry into the world of the superintendency was a little bit unusual. Hmm. Uh, I became a superintendent on November 1st which for anybody in the education field, you know, well, that's a weird date, right? Yeah. Superintendent gigs are usually August 1st start dates. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I happened to get hired into uh, Nordonia, where I am now. With, with the intention was eventually I was going to be the superintendent. They hired me as the assistant superintendent. And as soon as I got in there in Ohio, we called them levies. We had a levy up for operating money and it got crushed. The levy failed 80 to 20%. And then another levy failed and another levy failed and another levy failed to the point where we had laid off about 130 of our uh, 500 employees. We were cutting every sort of program and we were uh, one more levy failure away from the state taking us over. Wow. And at the time, the superintendent who was in office at the time, I think had really 
burned out, quite frankly. He he would brag about the number of unread emails in his inbox and he would just argue with people and wasn't receptive. And it got to the point where there were letters to the editor, to folks about, we're not going to vote for anything until he resigns, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a evening in October, I'm sitting at my desk. He comes in and says, Hey, I hope you're ready to be superintendent. I'm resigning tomorrow. <laughs> it happened like that. Wow. And so, yeah. And so that's November 1st on November 8th, that levy, the fifth time, it did pass. Now they had absolutely nothing to do with me. But what I realized really quickly there was that I was in a situation where the community had lost all trust in the administrative team, in the board, in the schools in general. And so it became really clear to me that the number one priority that I was going to have to do was to rebuild trust with the community. Now, fast forward nine years later, we had another levy on the ballot. It passed by the biggest margin ever in the district. And I think it, it came from nine years of really heavy lifting and building relationships. And that actually, you and I are talking before we sign on here that I, I'm, I'm work, I have a second book that I'm trying to get out there, but it's all about the journey from having no trust at all in the community to being to a point where uh, people really believe everything we tell them because we're always honest with them, you know? So it was, yeah. that was a big, a big deal for us. Yeah. And so Joe, you know, when we were talking before we pushed record, you were talking about your calendar and that you were getting feedback from your community and your parents to actually figure out when spring break was. And I thought that was an, a fantastic point of view. So, you know, you come into your position, you, <laughs> what are you doing to build trust from the community and to, to give them some empowerment? Yeah, well, I tell you, I mean, it was it was a really prescriptive thing that I went through. We I created this key communicator program. I based it a lot on the book "Schools Can't Do It Alone" by Jamie Vollmer. Mm -hmm. There's a chapter in there that talks about it, and I and I liked his ideas. And basically, I did this. I sat down with all the administrators on our team, and we listed every organization in our community. You know, PTAs, booster clubs. Um, YMCA, different churches, different businesses, labor organizations, the uh, Rotary and Kiwanis. We listed every organization we could think of. We had about 150 organizations we came up with. I sent all those folks, the leaders of all of those organizations, a letter saying, I want you to be part of my key communicators. Would you please come to a meeting? I invited them all to a meeting and told them two things. I wanted, I want you to do two things for me. One, Anytime that there's news about the school, I want to be able to email it to you so you have the facts from me before you hear it on the street or read about it in the newspaper. That's number one. Number two, I want you to invite me to your group, your booster club, your realty office, your church, um, whatever it is. And I just want to ask people three questions. What do you like about the schools? What can we do better? And what do you expect out of your superintendent? And so I spent about the first six months of my superintendency every night going somewhere with, and I don't, I'm an introvert, believe it or not, even, <laughs> even though I DJed for 20 some years, I am an introvert. I, I, I hate being in a group of people and, and having small talk. So I'd bring a principal with me just to kind of keep me calm and they would take notes <laughs> and I would ask those questions. And I just got a ton of feedback. So I got all of this data, organized it all. And then this is the key point is I listened to it, right? Yeah. If you're going to ask people for advice, you have to be willing to listen to the advice and you have to be vulnerable enough to say, you know what, even if this isn't something that I believe might be the best thing for us, the community owns the schools. If they want this, we're going to do that. One thing that came out, the community wanted a community service a graduation requirement. I don't, I don't know if I'm for that or against it, but the community clearly wanted it. So we put that in. And then all along the way, when something would happen, you know, the, the bus might break down. As soon as I got word of it, I'd shoot an email to all my key communicators. Hey, if you, if you guys hear that there was a bus accident, everybody's okay. This is what happened, et cetera. And I would send it out before the news would call and before anything. So people would know, oh, I know what's going on. You know, that wasn't reported right. Joe told us what was going on kind of thing. Right. And that, I think, set really set the tone for how we were going to interact with our community. I love that idea. Joe, we've talked about it multiple times. I've referenced your book, If the Dance Floor is Empty, Change the Song. And I just found so much value in this book. But for our listeners who haven't had a chance to read, will you just give a quick synopsis? You know, the book is one that I really enjoyed writing. And I think that most people would enjoy reading for a couple of reasons. There's no data in it. There's no research in it. There's no, it's stories. Yep. It's really all this book is. I do love to tell stories. And that comes from my camp director days. And I tell a whole bunch of stories. 
Some are stories about being a DJ. Some are stories about being a camp director. Some are stories about being the youngest of 11. Some are stories about being a teacher. Some are stories about going to baseball games and, and lessons I learned. And so I, I, I take all these stories and I, I tie them into some sort of educational lesson. And the book's divided really into five sections, advice for teachers, advice for principals, advice for superintendents really advice for living. Um, there are five sections that organize all these stories. And so uh, it's a quick read. It's an easy read. Yep. I think it's really fun. I laughed a lot writing the book and it's also touching. I think so people, are, people tell me that they laugh and they cry when they're, when they read it. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcasts. Now let's get back to the episode. So Joe, I want to talk about what you're doing right now for your future leaders within your organization, because obviously it's not just working with the community and working with your teachers, but it's also about building you know, the future. And I'm wondering what you do within your district for aspiring leaders. There was a time when um, a few years ago for, I, I actually had a leadership cohort that I would run within the district. So anybody that was in a who thought eventually they might want to become, move into administration, I would actually put on a series of, of workshops to talk to them about that. That was in my assistant superintendent days. The funny thing about my job is when I did become superintendent, they did not replace the assistant superintendent position. So I've been doing both of those jobs. So it's wow. it's been a little overwhelming, but what I do do uh, is I have a separate budget line item for leadership. And I talk all the time to our teachers about how, who of you is looking to one day move into administration. And every time I see that there's an opportunity for growth for them, if there's a conference, if there's a, a meeting, if there's a book, I put it out there for those folks and I support them as much as they can. I think one of the really key parts about being a leader is developing other leaders, you know, and even though I hate to see people leave the district, I think it's great for them when they leave the district, you know, I want people to be successful in their career. So whenever I get a chance, I try to, to share uh, opportunities for folks so they can professionally grow. For those who are listening that may not have a title or are looking to enhance their leadership journey, what is some advice that you have for them? You know, I think really, for me, my whole philosophy really centers around servant leadership. It is all about, you know, finding ways to give back. There, there's a quote from a book that I read in ninth grade that has stuck with me. And I talk about it in the book. Um, and I actually, I also put this quote on a piece of cardstock and I give it to every new teacher we hire. And that is this. It comes from a book called The Greatest Miracle in the World by Og Mandino. The surest way to doom yourself to mediocrity is to perform only the work for which you're paid. Mm -hmm. And I talk about that a lot, that if you want to, if you truly want to be great, and nobody goes into the career, by the way, saying, man, I hope I have a really average career. I hope 30 <laughs> years from now, people don't remember me. Everybody starts the career saying, I'm, I hope I'm going to be great. Well, the way to do that is to do more than what you're paid for. You, you have to be willing to go above and beyond. And that looks like different things. It might look like coming in early to help tutor a kid. It might mean giving up a lunch now and then to meet with students. It might mean on a Saturday morning, I'm going to a youth basketball game because I know a couple of kids are on, on the team and they, they love to have me there watching. So, you know, if, if you want, really want to aspire to leadership, first of all, the kids love it. But the other thing is parents and community members love it too. And they notice, they notice who's there. And when leadership positions open, you get calls from community members saying, hey, have you thought about this person? They're such a great teacher. They really need to be in a, in a position. It does such great things for kids, but it also does great things for yourself when you put yourself out there that way. So I want to talk about your journey as far as going above and beyond. What are some things that you did that were key that were above and beyond your position? You know, I, I talk about this a lot too in the book, and that is this, is that you know, everybody expects the uh, the superintendent to be at the Friday night football game. They expect him to be there and he's going to be there. Mm -hmm. They don't expect the superintendent to deliver popsicles to the kids at band camp. And that's one of the things I do every year. High school principal and I buy a bunch of popsicles, drive out to band camp, give them to the kids. Why? Because band kids are typically overlooked. And there's a ton of band parents there that love that we do that. But also, when I go to things like bowling meets or science Olympiad um, or mock trial, I never see other superintendents there. I just don't. 
Um, and it's only a, it's a couple uh, parents that might be there, but they talk, you know, when mm -hmm. neighbors are coming over, they'll say, you won't believe who came to the science Olympiad. I've never seen an administrator come to an event like this, but, but Dr. Clark was there. And the other thing I really like to do is what I call refrigerator letters, right? Everybody, it's so easy to send an email. Hey, you did a great job. You did a great job. I, I love to send letters to kids who do great things and staff members too, by the way, mm -hmm. because when, when a, when a kid or a staff member gets a letter mailed to their home, first of all, everybody else in the home wonders what it is until they can open it. You know, hey, what's this letter? Are you in trouble? And then they open it and it's a congratulations. You um, did a great job in the musical or hey, good luck going to sectionals in your swim meet or whatever. And those letters go up on the refrigerator. People come to visit pre-COVID and they say, Man, that's pretty impressive. And then that letter goes out on the table at their graduation party. You know, it's a, it's an artifact that they can have and hang on to until 20 years from now. You know, they're cleaning out their basement. Maybe they'll throw it away. But it gets a lot of mileage. It makes them feel good. And it makes people that see it feel good that they know you're recognizing. Again, not just the – and I love our football team, right? But every Friday night, every superintendent is going to be at the football game. Yep. That's expected. You're going to do that. It's all those other things – that you can do that people don't expect. Are you a super fan of the Aspire podcast? Well, now you can show off your support with the new Aspire swag featuring t-shirts, hoodies, and a variety of drinkware. You can find all your Aspire swag at teachbetter.com slash swag. Now let's get back to the podcast. I love that concept of giving an artifact and, you know, brightening someone's day that may not get that recognition. And that makes me think of something else that you said before is like teachers right now, potentially are working two, three jobs like you were um, when you were a teacher. And then of course, we've got the pandemic. And so a lot of people as far as morale might be down because of stress and, and all the things that are going on. So what is it that you're doing with your district as far as um, helping your teachers through kind of the mental health aspect or, or morale? That's a great question because, you know, when the pandemic first hit, it's just been about a year, right? We're about on the one year anniversary of yeah. when schools, at least in Ohio, closed down for good. And we focus so much uh, those first few months on this. This is a stressful time for everybody. The last thing we should be doing is adding stress to anybody's plates, staff or students. So let's remember what we're here for. We're here to serve others and not cause them stress. So we Frankly, I just say a yes a lot. Uh, I think there's a, there are some leaders who will say, no, you got to say no as much as you can or don't smile at Christmas. I say, I'm going to say yes as many times as I can until you give me a reason not to say yes. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing that's really, uh, I think, unique about my position, because you know how, you know how the field is, I, don't, I do not have the ability to give anybody a raise. I don't have the ability to give anybody a promotion. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can give anybody is time. And so I'm very generous with time when people say, hey, you know, my, my husband won a sales contest and he got a trip to Hawaii. Can, can I please take off three days in October so I can go to this trip? Well, inside I'm thinking, man, I'll never win a trip to Hawaii. I think, <laughs> of course, right? Of course. I'm going to say that because I can't do anything else for you. I can't, I can't give you a raise. That's negotiated within the contract, you know? So I, I give as much time as, as I can. And that's for people who say, you know, I've got a, I've got a doctor's appointment today at two o'clock. Do I really have to take a sick day? We'll cover for you. Go on, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I think when you treat people as professionals that way, they tend to respond as professionals. Plus the power of yes. I mean, like you said, how many times do people get to hear that word? Right. I mean, it's it's a lot easier to say yes. And, and the truth is this, even when somebody comes to me with a really bad idea and I have the ability to say, no, that's that's a bad idea. I say yes, because they're smart people. They're going to realize on their own that, hey, that's a bad idea, but they're going to be grateful that I gave them the ability to try it and they'll learn from something, you know. Mm -hmm. And I do have to say no every once in a while, but I say it's so rare that people are, are generally pretty accepting of what I do because, you know, I hardly ever order anybody to do anything and I hardly ever say no. Mm -hmm. It's, hey, we're professionals. Let's support each other as best we can. Well, Joe, you're doing some phenomenal things in your district and I, I have just enjoyed our conversation so much. For those who are listening, how can they connect with you on social media? My biggest social media I use is Twitter. So at Dr. Joe Clark, 
D-R-J-O-E-C-L-A-R-K. Also, my website is drjoeclark.com, and I do send out a, a newsletter uh, once or twice a month, and you could subscribe to that for free at Dr. Joe Clark. It's a lot of the same kind of thing you'll, you'll see in my books. I'm also, you can find me on Facebook, you can find me on Instagram, all with, with Dr. Joe Clark, but really Twitter and my website are the best ways to follow me around. Definitely. So make sure you're connecting with Joe and then signing up for his newsletter, but then also check out his book because, like I said, I love the stories that are in here. Again, the book is If the Dance Floor is Empty, Change the Song, and I'll have all of those links in the show notes. Joe, it was an honor to speak with you tonight. I felt like I learned so much, and you brought so much value to our listeners. Thank you again for being on the Aspire podcast. Joshua, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm honored, and uh, you know, I wish you the best down there in Texas. I know you guys had some tough time <laughs> there recently, and spring's coming, right? Yes, it is. Mm-hmm.